This week in the news, my friend, we are nerding out. We have so much science and business and legal news all kinds of things happening with brands behind the scenes that just isn't being talked about. So we are going to talk about those today so that you are well informed about everything that is going on. Along with all of that, the top news story that was everywhere all over the beauty news media this week was Beyonce's hair care line. We now know the launch date. We know the name. We know quite a few things about it. Not everything, but quite a few things about it. I'm going to share with you everything that I know. So so if that sounds interesting to you, if all of this news sounds interesting to you, hang tight. We are about to jump into it right now. Hello, my friend. Welcome back to What's Up in Makeup, where we talk about everything that is happening in the beauty space, in all of the brand news, all in one place. So let me tell you first story. First story is one that I know a lot of people are so, so excited about, and it is Beyonce's hair care line. She initially teased the launch back in May of 2023, and she has released this absolutely adorable video where she shows shots inside her mom's hair care studio back in the 90s. She says that Destiny's Child used to kind of practice there and perform there for her clients. Then she said, quote, I saw firsthand how the ways we nurture and celebrate hair can directly impact our souls. I watched her heal and be of service to many women, meaning her mother. Having learned so much on my hair journey, I've always dreamed of carrying on her legacy. I can't wait for you to experience what I've been creating. And people are very very, very, very excited about this. The post has over 3.5 million likes. Now, like I was saying in the intro, this was the big news story that all of the beauty news sources were talking about this week. And one particular news source brought up something that I hadn't noticed before. And it's the fact that Beyonce's fragrance line is called Say Noir and the name of the hair care line is Sacred. It's spelled the same way. As of the time I'm sitting down to film this, the actual products haven't been launched yet, but they are going to be shown very, very soon because launch date for Sacred is February 20th of 2024. That is so, so soon. Right before I sat down to film, I noticed that there was another video that Beyonce launched about the hair care line. And I was very interested to see that she had kind of a diverse group of people that she was doing the hair of. I assumed that it was going to be specifically for black hair, but apparently it's not. Even Bretman Rock, who used to be a beauty influencer, makes an appearance in the video. So I am very excited to see where she's going to go with this hair care line. I would imagine it's going to be mostly focused on black hair, but I think it's pretty cool that she might have some products that might be a little bit more universal so that other people can try it as well. I know a lot of us are kind of exhausted by celebrity beauty lines, but I'm curious to know what you think about this. Are you excited or to you, is it just another celebrity line? I'd love to know in the comments. Question for you. Did you watch the Grammys? I will be honest with you. I did not, but I am very much regretting it because apparently a lot of things happened. I was able to catch some of the high points as clips on YouTube, but I really wish I had watched it live. So many really interesting things happened. One of the things that I missed was SZA getting three Grammys. Oh my gosh, so, so, so happy for her. She won for Best R&B Song for Snooze, Best Pop Duo Group Performance for Ghost in the Machine with Phoebe Bridgers, and also Best Urban Contemporary Album for SOS. But besides winning the Grammys, SZA hopes to capture the hearts of beauty lovers because it looks like SZA may be coming out with her own makeup line. At Billboard's annual Power 100 event on January 31st at Newhouse Hollywood in Los Angeles, SZA presented the Clive Davis Visionary Award wearing a lip color combo that she says is from the upcoming line. What she did was she put on her Instagram stories the Getty Images image of her and then she wrote on top of it she typed on top of it and she said also wearing my own lip 
products down to the liner and it looks absolutely gorgeous on her. According to Essence Magazine though, SZA was not wearing her line at the Grammys, but was only wearing one brand. The makeup artist is her longtime makeup artist. Her name is Deanna Paley and she used solely Byredo makeup. Have you ever used Byredo makeup? I've seen it across my Instagram feed, but it, it hasn't been on my radar at all. Is it something that I should try? Because it looked fantastic on her, but I honestly, I think any makeup will look fantastic on her. She's so gorgeous. So like we were talking about in the Beyonce story, cosmetic design had said that the number of celebrity beauty brands dropped by half. Uh, it was at 19 celebrity beauty brands launching in 2022 and only six, so less than half in 2023. So now we know we're in February of 2024. We have Beyonce's hair care line, SZA's makeup line. I'm sure there will be a lot more. I have a feeling that celebrity makeup launches, like the brand new lines, will be somewhere in between 2022 and 2023. I'm going to guess 12. That's where I'm going to go with it. But I'm curious what you think. Do you think that consumers are telling brands, hey, we're done with celebrity brands? Or do you feel like there's going to be an uptick due to the success of some of the current celebrity brands? I would love to know what you think. I have kind of a love-hate relationship with TikTok in that like sometimes I go on there and I just scroll and scroll and scroll and I have to stop myself from scrolling more. And sometimes it's like I'm just so annoyed with the fact that I've wasted so much time. One of the reasons why I get so annoyed is it seems like there's a lot more of those paid ads popping up as I scroll. And even as I scroll and I'm scrolling past paid ads, a lot of the content that's coming across my feed also has ad sponsorship on it and it just feels like one giant ad. Now, I do social media for a living. I pay my bills off of the ads on videos like this. I do not have a problem with ads on content. But when you're getting so many ads over and over and over and over again and it's constantly disrupting the user experience every minute or two, it starts to get a little bit exhausting and it makes me not want to visit the platform as much. But I have some sad news. According to a report published by Bloomberg, TikTok is piloting a new feature that can make all posts on the social media platform shoppable, every single one. The widget would identify objects in any given video and then automatically link similar items on the TikTok shop. They say that the new feature is actually designed to reduce ad content, enabling creators to concentrate on providing entertainment without the hard sell. Maybe I'm just not connecting the dots here. Sometimes I just don't. I guess because it's not gonna be as obtrusive, it's gonna be one of those things where if you see a creator using something, you'll just know if you wanna shop it, you'll be able to, but there won't be as many pop-ups that are like interfering with the viewer's experience. Maybe that's it. The the goal of TikTok, at least according to press releases, is that they're trying to be more like Amazon. They want you to be shopping constantly as you were on the platform so that they can take their cut. I guess we're just going to have to wait and see whether it enhances the user experience or takes away from it. In science news this week, you know that I am very anti-clean beauty in that the clean beauty movement is not regulated. You can say anything is clean. There's no standard set of, from the government as to what is clean and what is not. And a lot of times brands will use fear mongering of ingredients that are actually not harmful for you because of maybe where they're made or some animal study where they put the ingredient in 100% concentration in the eyes of the animal and the animal was like, ah, and then they say, no, don't put this in cosmetics because it hurt the animal, but it's like in cosmetics, it's in like a 0.01% concentration where when you squeeze it in the animal, was it a hundred percent concentration? You know what I'm saying? So a lot of the clean beauty stuff I think is absolute garbage. But one thing that I think is really important is weeding out and teasing out the possible dangers, actual dangers of real ingredients. And when those studies pop up, I like to let you know. Of course, like I've said a million times, science is always changing. We're always learning new things. But this is something that came up this week that I thought was really important to share. You may have noticed that when you're searching on like Sephora's website or other websites, it says specifically that products are made without phthalates. These are ingredients that are sometimes used as preservatives, they're product stabilizers, and they also might help dissolve other substances so that the brand can get the texture that they want. 
They're known as plasticizers. They were introduced into the market in the 1920s as part of what made up vinyl. Vinyl is the most widely produced plastic polymer in the entire world. The phthalates in the plastic are used to make the product more pliable and bendable and also make it less likely to break. Last week, a study was published and it was funded by NIH grants. It was done by a private research university called NYU Grossman School of Medicine. In that study, they linked hormone disrupting qualities of phthalates to nearly 56,600 preterm births in the U.S. The report states that resulting medical costs were estimated to reach a minimum of $1.6 billion and as much as $8.1 billion over the lifetime of the children affected. The study published online on February 6th in the journal, The Lancet Planetary Health is believed to be the largest of its kind to date with 5,000 participants and includes information from a much more racially and ethnically diverse group of women than previous studies on the topic. The purpose was to evaluate the prenatal exposure to phthalates. And what they did was they tested the urine of these 5,000 different women, and they tested them for these 20 different metabolites. That's the breakdown of the phthalates that you find in the urine. Then they compared how much of the metabolites they found in the urine versus the frequency of the preterm births. After the babies were born, they looked at the impacts on the weight and the gestational age of the babies. Because of what the researchers found, they put out a strong call for the regulation of phthalates in general in our products that we use. It's really important to note here, though, because we are in the makeup news space here, that we don't know where these women were exposed to the phthalates because phthalates are so common in these polymer plastics. So it could have been through cosmetics, but it could have been through so many other things. So my point in sharing this with you is it seems like removing phthalates from cosmetics is not a bad idea. We don't have a direct link between cosmetics and the preterm births and the problems, but if we can find replacements for those, it sounds like that's a fantastic idea. And if you are pregnant or trying to get pregnant, you may want to look for phthalate-free makeup and cosmetic products. Just in the utmost of caution, makeup products and other cosmetic products that are phthalate free. It is time once again, my friends, for legal news. I'll admit this one's a little bit of a stretch because I just wanted to hit the gavel, but I do think that this is relevant because I know a lot of people that watch the show shop with either Timu or Shein or both. Did you know that these two companies have been fighting for like a little over a year. They have been fighting in court back and forth. You know, you did this to me, but you did this to me. A lot of it having to do with copying and copyright claims. And you stole this from our website and you stole this image from us. It's a lot of that kind of thing. If you're not familiar with the two companies, Shein and Timu, they sell all kinds of stuff from cosmetics to jewelry to things for around your house to toys and clothing and everything, like all of the things. <laughs> They sell all of it. They're Chinese companies. And the thing about these particular companies is they sell things at a very, 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 very cheap cost. Really cheap. Like, for example, you may get a shirt at Target for $15. You could get the same shirt at Timu for maybe $7. So because of these very inexpensive prices and some of the marketing tactics that they use, they have become extremely popular over the past couple of years. So back to the court cases. So like I was saying, they've been fighting back and forth in court for a little over a year. And it is because of this court case that we may find out specifically what is going on with Timu and how they are keeping their prices so low. A federal court in Washington, D.C denied Timu's request to protect the identities of its third-party suppliers in its lawsuit against Shein. Timu alleges in the complaint that Shein is engaging in a far-ranging effort to intimidate its third-party suppliers, quote, mafia style, and retaliate against them for doing business with Timu. 
the court said, yeah, there could be a potential harm, but they were like, you're not presenting us with enough information that your suppliers are in danger. So we're going to make you tell us who your suppliers are. So I'm wondering that if besides them being worried about Shein retaliating against their suppliers, I'm wondering if maybe there's some shady business going on with some of these suppliers and they don't want American consumers to find out about it, that maybe that'll lead people to know that there's something going on maybe with the labor conditions or the quality of the product something going on that's going to scare U.S. customers because there is a lot of money at stake here. Timu and Shein have passed companies like H&M and Zara in sales. They are doing a ridiculous amount of business in the U.S. In the decision to make Timu's suppliers public, the court emphasized Shein's right to confront allegations against it, highlighting the importance of the information to Shein's defense in order to prove the suit is without merit. So my question to you is, do you buy from Shein and or Timu? I know some people call it Shein. Back when Shein first started, it was very clear that it was Shein, not Sheen. But literally everybody that I know now calls it Sheen. So it's whatever, whatever you want to call it. Do you shop there? And the question is, if you found out that the reason why things were very, very cheap were because of poor working conditions or that maybe the products weren't safe or they were being made in an illegal way, would that stop you from shopping there? Or are you all about the deals and it doesn't matter because that's you want the stuff and it's extremely cheap? I would love to know your thoughts because I feel like this is very much an individual person decision. In business news today, we have information about how different businesses are doing, which businesses are doing amazing, and which ones are really going in a bad direction and trying to recover ground. So let's start with the positive ones. We're going to start with Cody. So Cody is crushing it. They had a whopping 13% jump in sales, raking in $1.7 billion in quarter two. Now, the operating income for them is up by 19% to a cool $236.7 million. As part of the report, they credited their Lux division, which soared 17% to hit $1.2 billion in sales. Their net income, though, did dip a little bit to $177 million. I know, it's like it went lower to $177 million, but it was at $235 million. And they say that that's specifically because they sold a 3.6% stake in Wella, but they still own a lot of Wella, so they're thinking it's going to go back up. Their current stake, which is 22.3%, is worth about $900 million. That is freaking ridiculous. But the superstar of the Cody-owned products was Burberry Fragrances. Burberry Goddess was the biggest launch in Cody history, Cody has been around for freaking ever, but that fragrance broke every record. 60% sales spike at launch, that is nuts. Other popular Cody-owned fragrances include Boss's Bottled Elixir, Gucci Flora Gorgeous Magnolia, and additions to the Chloe Atelier de Flore fragrance line. This is interesting as far as what we're going to see in the future, and this has to do with influencer marketing. So they have upped their budget for influencer marketing, pushing products from CoverGirl, Rimmel, and Sally Hansen specifically. They said that influencer marketing was fantastic for the CoverGirl Simply Ageless Skin Perfector Foundation that that influencer campaign did very, very well. So Cody is one of the ones on the up and up, and the other one that is on the up and up is Elf Beauty. Now, we talked about last week in the product report that they were going to have a Super Bowl commercial that was going to run in real time is today. And you probably know how expensive those Super Bowl commercials are. But I'm feeling like this is just kind of a blip out of Elf's pocket. They are still doing so, so incredibly well. Net sales increased, oh my gosh, 85% to about $271 million for the three months ending in December 31st of 2023, marking its 20th, 20th consecutive quarter 
of gain. That is a lot. Net income for the period reached $26.9 million, up from $19.1 million last year. Elf is now forecasting full year sales and range from $980 million and $990 million. That is a lot of product considering their most expensive products are around 20 bucks. Apparently they had higher sales this year on Amazon and also on the TikTok shop. Another big thing to watch for Elf is in their quarter three, they grew 119% in international sales, mostly in Canada and the UK. The five largest, what they call franchises in the Elf line are the Halo Glow line, the Camo line, especially the new blushes, the Power Grip line, the Holy Hydration line, and the Putty line. CEO Tarang Amin said the brand's new Glow Reviver lip oils are, quote, one of the most requested items from our community. Elf also participated in what they call activations, like the one that they did on Roblox to help kids learn about being entrepreneurs. Apparently that had over 4 million plays since launch with a 96% approval rating from users, which apparently is unheard of. But Elf is not just doing a Super Bowl ad. Oh no, they are thinking much, much bigger than that. But I will have that whole story in tomorrow's product report. Now, if you were sitting this morning having your morning coffee or whatever you do in the morning and you were thinking, you're like, man, I just wish there were more Walmart stores. You are gonna, it's dream come true time for you because Walmart is expanding 150 more stores. And the reason why they wanna do this is because they're starting to use those Walmart stores as fulfillment centers for their online orders. They are going full Amazon. Like they wanna have these stores be like Amazon warehouses. In 2024, the plans are to open 12 of those stores. They also want to remodel 650 stores, 50 of those stores they wanna make from regular Walmarts to Walmart super centers. Apparently in the US, Walmart store openings outpaced closures in 2023 only for the second year in a row because remember they were struggling for a little bit for a while, but they seem to be picking back up and that direction to be more like Amazon seems to be kind of where they're putting all their eggs in that basket. So we'll have to see how that goes and watch that one closely. Now, as far as companies not doing so well, we've kind of alluded to this in previous episodes of What's Been Makeup. Let's talk about Estee Lauder. It is not not good, my friends. So they are set to slash nearly 3,100 jobs, leading to the complete removal of some positions and also retaining and rearranging other positions. Fabrizio Freda, who is the president and CEO of Estee Lauder, he said the move was a difficult decision, but he said that it was necessary for the company to return to a, quote, more sustainable profitability. Sales fell by 7% to 4.28 billion dollars so they're still doing you know billions of dollars but it is falling during the three months to December 31st of 2023 with organic sales down eight percent a big issue with Estee Lauder is something that Cody has been able to do fine they're doing okay in the Asian market Cody is but Estee Lauder has not been able to recover since the pandemic they say specifically the Asia travel retail segment along with less demand for prestige beauty in mainland China are specifically impacting their sales. This really surprised me though, is that they're saying the sluggish sales of MAC Cosmetics is also very much impacting them. Now this didn't surprise me because I remember when we did the story and y'all were pissed about this, one of the reasons why they're saying MAC Cosmetics has more sluggish sales is because they changed the back to MAC program and a lot of y'all were pissed about that. So I'm not surprised that that's impacting things that y'all didn't like those changes and now that's impacted MAC's sales. The plans are to increase their focus on brands like Clinique, The Ordinary, La Mer, and Jo Malone fragrances, as well as trying to regain that ground in China. Another big parent company that's struggling is THG or The Hut Group. They own so many brands over so many different categories, but in the beauty space, you may have heard of some of the brands like Ico, Illamasqua, Paracone MD, and the beauty subscription Glossy Box. THG is looking to cut 160 jobs that they call redundancies across its operations. The headcount cut will be split between marketing and sales roles and warehouse functions 
functions. So 100 warehouse jobs and 60 marketing and sales jobs. They're saying the warehouse workers jobs are being cut because they're moving more toward automation in their warehouses. A THG spokesperson told the press that layoffs are quote, in line with its strategic pivot towards larger enterprise clients. It's always sad to see when companies are having to cut jobs. And I don't know how THG comes back from this because if you look at the names of the brands, the only one that I feel like seems to be doing well in my eyes, the one that I see a lot of marketing for, that's good marketing, great products coming out is Paracone MD. I've seen quite a few really interesting products coming out from them, but Ico and Illabasca, I haven't heard anything from those brands in a very, very long time. Of course, they own so many more brands that are going to make a difference as far as their overall ability to do well as a parent company. But as far as beauty brands, I feel like Ico and Illamasqua, just they really need to bump it up, at least here in the States. Uh, THG is a British company, so maybe they're more prominent and doing more advertising in the UK. The last business news story is an update on the messy, messy, mess, mess of Makeup Revolution. This has been a story we've been covering for about a year and it looks like this is finally calming down. This may be the big resolution to all of this. If you don't know this story, basically there were two dudes at the top of Makeup Revolution. There's Adam Minto and there's Tom Allsworth. They were the ones that started, well, I know at least Adam Minto started Makeup Revolution. They're, they're the big guys, right? They got in big trouble for alleged shady business. And the, that alleged shady business led to Makeup Revolution not putting out their numbers like they were supposed to as far as what their their financials were for the year of 2022. So because they didn't put their numbers out, they were removed from the British Stock Exchange and Revolution lost a ton of money. So the update is that Revolution Beauty has announced that it's reached a settlement with Adam related to the events that happened back at the end of 2022. Under the terms of the agreement, Adam has agreed to pay the company 2.9 million pounds in six annual installments. But but neither party is accepting liability for what happened. In a statement, Alastair McGeorge, he is the current and non-executive chairman over at Revolution, commented, quote, we are very pleased to have reached an agreement with Adam. This together with the revised payment schedule agreed in December of 2023 for the acquisition of Medicam. That was the Tom Allsworth piece. Medicam was a, a company that Tom Allsworth started and then Makeup Revolution bought it for 23 million pounds. Again, it was a whole big messy mess, mess, mess. They say that now that they are settling out those two pieces, they can now focus on the future. They said they look forward to providing an update on their strategy at their upcoming Capital Markets event. So it seems to be calming down over there at Makeup Revolution. And I genuinely feel like if you did not follow this show or if you don't keep up with what's happening in the beauty news sources that are online, you have no idea that just was going down over at Revolution over the last year. Uh, it was a freaking mess over there. So it seems like things are kind of starting to calm down and the leadership is finding its footing. So we'll just have to see what happens and what we see on our end as customers. So this last story is kind of a feel good story. And it's I like to end what's been make up when I can on a happy note. And it's related to the fact that I feel like every person has at some point or another go, had to go out in public. And there was something about our appearance that we didn't like and there was nothing we could do about it. Like maybe it was a blemish or a scratch or a scar or um, a bruise or a cold sore or something on our face where we're like, everybody's staring at me and you just didn't feel confident because of that thing. And there seems to be a push from brand brands to try to normalize and try to help people not feel bad about some of these things that just naturally happen with our bodies. And Abreva, who makes products to treat cold sores, they want people to, quote, rock their cold sores with confidence as they unveiled a pair of diamond lips adorned with one ruby to represent a cold sore. The piece was fashioned to destigmatize the condition. They say that two out of three young cold sore sufferers say their self-esteem and confidence is shaken when they have a cold sore. The lips are made of 197 lab-grown diamonds set with white gold. 
Cold Sore sufferers can enter to win this set of lips, as well as a chance to take home one of a select number of sterling silver lip necklaces, also featuring one single ruby. From now until February 29th, you can enter to win at www.abreva.com slash diamond lips. It's going to be in the description box down below as well. One winner is going to take home the lips alongside a Breva Cold Sore Cream and an all new Raid Pain Relief product. 25 Five first place winners will win the sterling silver necklaces with the one ruby and then a select number of other winners will just get free product and I thought that this was really nice I think that it's easy to just kind of dismiss this and poo poo this it's like ah you know and and see this as a negative but you know when we have things that happen naturally within our bodies and there's nothing that we can do about it it's it's nice to make people feel like I'm not this isn't abnormal. This is something that a lot of people deal with and it's not something to be ashamed of. It's just part of life. And I think it's really cool to try to take that stigma away for people that maybe have felt really self-conscious and give them a little bit of a confidence boost through something like this. Like I know it's just marketing. I know that it's just to get press on the brand, but but still, I think it's a nice way to do it. And that, my friend, was What's Up in Makeup this week. Thank you so, so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the show. If you did, please give this video a thumbs up it really does help me out so so much and if you want to be guaranteed that youtube is going to tell you when there's a new episode of what's been makeup please hit the subscribe button it will make sure that what's up in makeup is in your subscription feed uh youtube may show it to you on your homepage, and it may not that's the way to make sure that you'll know exactly where it is but if you're not subscribed you can also go to my channel page to find it or you can just search for what's up in makeup Thank you, as always, to the What's Up and Makeup Facebook hunters. Their names are scrolling below me. Thank you so much for all of your submissions this week. I appreciate you so, so much. Our chat today will be at 10 a.m. Eastern time. Hopefully, you can hang out and join us as we talk about makeup. But if you can't, it is no problem at all. You can also watch it on the replay by going to my channel page and clicking on the live tab. If you are subscribed, it'll just be popped into your subscription feed. And if you would like to listen to it as a podcast style, the What's Up and Makeup live chat podcast link is down in the description box down below. Thank you. Thank you again so so much for watching i appreciate you more than i could ever express if you would like to hang out just a little bit longer youtube should be recommending a couple videos for you over here to watch including last week's episode of top news of what's been makeup is going to be down there youtube's going to pick the top one based on your viewing history but if you got to go because you got stuff to do i get it there's no problem at all thank you for hanging out as long as you did and i'd love to i will see you in a video very very soon bye